Welcome to the River Online Sermon for Sunday, April 11th. Can you believe it's been over a year since we first started these online sermons? I want you to know that as things continue to become more open and accessible, uh, we are committed to continuing to offer this online sermon for those who can't be with us in person. Uh, we can, you can still join us on our Facebook Live as well, but I know that doesn't work for everyone. So I hope you find these helpful, and, and please let us know of any ways we can better serve you if you're not able to join us in person. Let me pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day and for this time to, to dig into your word. I thank you for everybody who is listening, and I pray that you would bless them in whatever their circumstances might be. I pray that you would bless our time together now today, and I pray that you would help me as I preach that I'd be attentive to your Holy Spirit and that you would receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I came across an interesting article uh, on a site called Artnet News. And the article was from this past fall, and it spoke of a new super white paint that has been developed by scientists at Purdue University. This new white acrylic paint reflects 95.5% of sunlight. The engineers designed the paint to keep buildings cooler and to prevent machinery from overheating. It includes the use of calcium carbonate fillers, which is a substance found in some rocks and seashells, and those fillers give the paint added reflectivity, which means it stays cooler than the ambient temperature even when the sun is shining. Testing found that surfaces painted with this new white paint were up to 18 degrees cooler than the surrounding areas. According to their calculations, a one-story building of about 1,100 square feet painted with this new white paint could save about a dollar a day on their air conditioning costs. Researchers have even made the suggestion that it could be used to paint roads and other structures to reflect heat, thereby lowering the temperatures of the Earth's surface itself. We'll see if that ever takes place. It was an interesting article, and my suggestion is to call this new paint color Transfiguration White. The reason for that should become obvious as we look at our passage for today. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 9. So we're currently in the middle of a sermon series on the life of Peter. And last week for Easter, we, we, took, um, we, we kind of skipped ahead to the story of the resurrection. But that meant that we passed over some important events from the life of Peter. So over the next few weeks, we'll be going back to look at some of those passages. Today, we're going to take a look at a, a relatively famous event called the Transfiguration. This event most likely took place somewhere in the late middle of Jesus' earthly ministry. It was probably a little less than a year before the crucifixion. That means that by the time we arrive at Mark 9, Jesus had his, has had a significant amount of time with his disciples and is well on his well into his his ministry here on earth but there's still time before the crucifixion let's pick things up in mark 9 with verse 2 and after six days jesus took with him peter and james and john and led them up a high mountain by themselves and he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them and there appeared to them elijah with moses and they were talking with jesus okay so let's dig into what this is saying Verse 2 begins with, and after six days, which begs the question, six days after what? So maybe you remember about three weeks ago, we took a look at Peter's confession of Christ. That was where Peter declared that Jesus is Christ the Lord. And then right after that, Jesus shared about the suffering uh, that he was going to have to go through and, and um, that what was coming with the crucifixion and everything. We see that passage at the end of Mark 8. So when verse 2 of, of chapter 9 mentions six days later, it is speaking of that confession of Christ and the surrounding conversation. That's important because it anchors this moment, this event in Jesus' history, connecting it specifically with that conversation. Mark then points out that Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John up onto the mountain. So why those three? We've talked in the past about how for some reason, Jesus specifically chose these three guys uh, to give them some kind of like backstage pass uh, for an even closer intimate view into his life and ministry. Remember earlier in our sermon series, uh, these three were present for the healing of Jairus' daughter, even though the rest of the disciples had to wait outside. 
Now, I don't know why these three, rather than Philip or Andrew or Thomas for that matter, I don't know if it was because they pursued a closer relationship with Christ or if they had a stronger faith or if they had a, a clearer understanding of who he really was. Scripture doesn't really tell us why. But it is interesting to note that these three guys had this experience with Christ that the other disciples did not receive. So they headed up this mountain. Now, we don't know which mountain this is referring to. Traditionally, it is thought to have been Mount Hermon near Caesarea Philippi, where Jesus had that conversation uh, with Peter's confession. Um, although some believe it was maybe Mount Tabor, which is closer to Nazareth. The mountain itself is not the main point. What really matters is what happened on the mountain. Mark says that Jesus was transfigured in front of them. So what does that mean, transfigured? What's that word mean? So the word is in the Greek is the word metamorpho, and it means to change the existing form, like a metamorphosis. The Greek word is actually used four times in Scripture. It is used here and in Matthew 17 to speak of Christ's transfiguration, but it's also used two other times. Once in Romans 12, 2, where it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then again in 2 Corinthians 3.18, where it says, And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't think it's the main point of the passage, but it's interesting to note that the same word that is used to speak of Christ's transfiguration is also used to speak of the spiritual transformation that Christ wants for his followers. Kind of cool, right? But let's focus on what this transfiguration for Christ is all about. Now, I want to point out that I don't believe that this passage is, is saying that Jesus was transfigured into something else, like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, but rather that he was transfigured in some way that somehow showed his heavenly form, or at least a portion of it. What I mean by that is that I think it was kind of like the curtain was pulled back a little bit for Peter, James, and John to see Christ in his heavenly splendor and majesty. Remember Philippians 2 speaks of how Christ left his heavenly splendor to come to earth, taking the very form of a servant and being born in human likeness. I think this transfiguration allowed these three to get a glimpse of Christ in what was more true to his heavenly form. I also love the details about his clothes being radiant, whiter than anyone in the world could possibly bleach them. Kind of sounds like a commercial for like a, some kind of new laundry detergent or something. The words here speak of shining and glistening brightness, and the original Greek refers to someone who served as a fuller or launderer, someone who specifically treated cloth. And the word for bleach um, is tied in with the word for white, meaning to make something white. So it's saying that Jesus's clothes were so white that even the person whose job was to make cloth white could not possibly make it that white. It's like a radiant whiteness. That's why I use that opening illustration of the Purdue engineers coming up with that new white acrylic paint. I picture this transfiguration as if Jesus's clothes themselves were like a material that reflected the sun back at them in, in radiant, dazzling light, which is why I said that Purdue engineers could call their paint color transfiguration white. Then in the midst of that radiant brilliance, the blinding light, Elijah and Moses showed up. What do you think of that detail? So first of all, I want to point out that it's interesting that Peter, James, and John apparently knew who these guys were. I mean, think about this for a moment. This is well before photography, and while portrait painting could have been a thing already, I doubt that Moses and Elijah were sitting for portraits. And even if they did, it wasn't like these guys were studying the, the images to know what these guys looked like. Or It's not like they carried around some kind of baseball cards of Old Testament heroes or something like that. So how did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? So that leads me to think that either Jesus told them or that God supernaturally, supernaturally revealed it to them, which suggests that it wasn't just two random Old Testament guys, but very specifically these two, Elijah and Moses, that, that God chose 
them for this moment. So why them? Well, there are a lot of different views on that. Elijah's presence connects with a prophecy from Malachi about Elijah being sent before the day of the Lord. But Moses doesn't really carry that same kind of connection. Some scholars believe that, that Moses' presence reflects the, the, the law or the old covenant, and Elijah's uh, presence represents the prophets. However, if that was the case, it would be more correct to have Moses' name first. And also, if there was someone who was used to represent the prophets, wouldn't it more likely be Isaiah or Jeremiah? Other scholars point to the mystery surrounding the deaths of these two guys. You see, Elijah was taken away, uh, taken out away from earth on a, a chariot of fire up to heaven. And Moses was apparently taken by God up onto a mountain where he died and God buried him, but nobody knew the place of his burial. So because of those unusual circumstances regarding the end of their lives, some speculate that that's why these two are the ones who are on the mountain. Others make reference to Elijah and Moses each being familiar with suffering and, and each having their own kind of mountaintop experiences like Moses on Mount Sinai and Elijah on Mount Horeb. And Moses was con considered a precursor to Christ and Elijah was seen as one to prepare the way. So that makes a little more sense to me than some of the other theories, but ultimately I don't have to know why it was these two, why these two were the ones who were, who were there at that moment. Remember, this moment was not about who, which Old Testament hero most deserved to be on the Mount Rushmore of heroes. The point of the story is not about who was with Jesus, but on the transfiguration of Jesus himself. So before we continue on, what do you think of this moment so far? It, it's pretty beautiful, isn't it? Can you get, are you starting to get an image, a picture of what's happening? It seems like a, like a holy, sacred, sanctified mountaintop experience with Christ. At least it is until Peter inter interrupts things. Let's pick things up with verse 5. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. So what do you think of Peter interrupting uh, this scene? Sure, it's a it should come as no surprise, right? We've noticed before how it seems like Peter is kind of uncomfortable with silence. He can't contain himself. Notice that verse 6 even says that he did not know what to say. Yet, still he said something. That's a clue, by the way. If you don't have anything to say, if you don't know what to say, then it's probably best not to say anything. But what do you think of what Peter said? So he was right in that it was good for them to be there. It was a good and powerful holy moment. And Peter recognized it for what it was. But he didn't know what to do with the moment. Remember that. We'll come back to that later. In his discomfort, Peter suggested putting up tents. What's that all about? So this word could represent a, a tent or a tabernacle or any kind of temporary structure. The Jews um, each year celebrated the Feast of the Tabernacles or booths to, to remind them of when they wandered in the wilderness. This temporary shelter would have been uh, something that would have fit with that kind of, of um, structure for something like that as well. It seems like Peter was suggesting building places for um, Jesus Moses and Elijah to stay. I don't know, maybe he was thinking that Peter, that, that people would be able to hike up the mountain, make a trek up the mountain and, and meet with these people. I don't know. But there are a couple of problems with his suggestion. First of all, it kind of suggests that Moses and Elijah were on par with Jesus. But while Moses and Elijah are great heroes of the faith, make no mistake, they are not on par with Christ. He was not just a prophet, as, as Peter uh, had just recently confessed. Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. The second problem with Peter's suggestion is that Peter wants them to stay on the mountaintop. But Jesus couldn't stay on the mountaintop. His work was not finished yet. If Jesus had stayed on the mountain, it meant that he never would have descended into the valley of suffering and death that he eventually needed to go through in order to complete the work he had come to earth to do. I appreciate Peter's desire. 
I understand why he wanted to stay the way they were. But he was wrong. This mountaintop experience was just a glimpse of the glory that was still to come. Remember that, and we'll come back to that as well. Notice then that verse 6 says that they were terrified. That word means frightened and horrified. What do you, what do you think of, of, of that emotion in this moment? So I think that when we think of coming into God's presence, we picture his love and grace and goodness, and that's fine. But we also know, need to recognize that this was a moment of seeing Christ in his glory and holiness as well. The idea of the radiant whiteness reminds me of, of how John speaks of Christ as the light. And in the presence of his holy light, I would imagine it would strike terror in the realization of the imperfect nature of man. A light so strong that it illuminates all the darkness still within them and horrifies them, not because of what they see in Christ, but because of what they see of themselves in his presence doesn't mean that the time wasn't good, but there was also some other emotions involved. Now, the moment is not quite complete, so let's finish things up with verses 7 and 8. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. So what do you make of this voice from the cloud? So this is reminiscent of two things, right? First of all, it's reminiscent of how during the time of Moses, God would be with his people uh, with the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and, and how God would speak from the cloud like he did on Mount Sinai. It's also reminiscent of Jesus' baptism, uh, where a, as he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. What a powerful moment to hear God's voice from heaven. And this has special um, significance when we think of it, the connection to uh, the, the moment just six days earlier with Peter's confession of Christ. That moment when Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, was great. But here, the testimony about who Jesus is is coming from God. And then the moment passed. The mountaintop experience was finished. So overall, what do you think of this mountaintop experience? It's interesting to note that throughout this transfiguration moment, we see the focus constantly shifted to the disciples. Yes, we receive the details that allow us to imagine the transfiguration, but notice the repeated appearance of the word them. Jesus led them up the mountain. He was transfigured before them. There appeared to them Elijah with Moses. A cloud overshadowed them. I don't know why Jesus specifically chose these three, but it does seem that at least to some extent, this mountaintop experience was specifically for them. So that brings me to the question, do you think that God has mountaintop experiences that he wants for us as well? So I believe he does. I believe he wants us to experience him. He wants us to know him more. So he invites us up onto the mountain to experience him in moments like these. Not exactly this, but our own mountaintop experiences with him. So with that in mind, I think that there are a couple of things, a few things we need to recognize from this passage regarding the mountaintop. First of all, I believe that we need to create space in our lives for these mountaintop experiences to happen. We need to remember that these three guys gave up their lives to follow Christ. They put such a priority on him that everything else took a back seat. If they had not done that, then they would have missed out on this moment. Too often, our lives are so busy that we don't even hear Christ calling us up onto the mountain. We need to set aside time for intimacy with Christ, listening to him, abiding in him, letting him lead us up onto the mountain. The second thing I want, I think we can learn from this is related to the way Peter handled it. I think the way that he jumped in with his suggestion about the tents shows that he was uncomfortable with the holy moment. He saw that it was good, but he didn't know what to do with it. It was probably uncomfortable and 
And even the, the word terror suggests that there were a lot of emotions involved. So the question is, how comfortable would we be in this setting? Are we open to having a holy, sacred moment with the Lord? Are we okay with the discomfort that might accompany it? Would we stay in the moment or break the silence with some gibberish of our own? And then I think the third thing for us to recognize is that while mountaintop experiences are great, they're meant to be temporary. They're glimpses of a greater glory that is still to come. So we can't stay on the mountaintop. Life is not lived on the mountain. Those mountaintop experiences are life-changing, but so are the things we learn in the valley. Have you ever read the devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers? I used that book for my devotions when I was younger, and there was one devotional in particular that always stuck with me. In it, Chambers referred to this particular transfiguration passage and he wrote this we are not made for the mountains for sunrises or for the other beautiful attractions in life those are simply intended to be moments of inspiration we are made for the valleys and the ordinary things of life and that is where we have to prov prove our stamina and strength yet our spiritual selfishness always wants repeated moments on the mountain we feel that we could talk and live like perfect angels if we could only stay on the mountaintop. Those times of exaltation are exceptional, and they have their meaning in our life with God, but we must beware to prevent our spiritual selfishness from wanting to make them the only time. Jesus took these three men up the mountain for a spiritual experience that seems to have been specifically intended for them. Then it was over, and he took them back down the mountain and continued their journey from there. I hope that God gives us all many amazing mountaintop experiences, and I hope that we are ready for them, placing ourselves in position to hear him when he calls us up onto the mountain. And I hope that when those moments come, we will be open to all that God wants to do, even if it's not fully comfortable and that we would recognize the greatness and the holiness of those moments. And I also hope that we will remember though, that the journey, that the mountaintop is only part of the journey and, and, and that we would take with us from that experience, the things God wants us to receive, that we would allow ourselves to be transformed in those moments but that we would also recognize that they are just a moment, a glimpse of the glory that is still to come. And that we would continue our journey through the plains and valleys that we must walk through as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would provide us with mountaintop experiences. I pray that you would help us to be ready for them, that you would help us to be having that kind of intimacy with you where we can hear you calling us onto the mountain. I pray that you would help us to experience you and to, to let you do with those mountaintop experiences that which you want to do. And um, even though there may be discomfort and even though there may be a lot of emotions involved, that we'd be open to your work and to your, the transformation, the transfiguration you really want to do in our lives. And then also, Lord, may you help us to recognize that the mountaintop experiences are not the entirety of our journey, but that we would be willing to come down from the mountain as well and continue the journey that you have for us, holding on to what we've learned and, and allowing that transformation to transform how we then continue to follow you. But help us to be open to all that you want us to experience, all that you want us to do as we walk through this life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.